Imagine for like half a minute that you're someone who wants to break into a company at night, perhaps. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to observe the perimeter of the building, maybe the inside if possible, see what are the personnel schedules, guards, security cameras, anything that can be used to detect your intrusion attempt. Now, why do you have to monitor all that? That's because all those things are actual layers, defense layers that you'll have to overcome in order to gain access to that building. And that's the exact same concept that we're going to talk about right now, defense in depth. Defense in Depth is all about designing your network or cybersecurity in such a way so that you have different layers of defense. So that if one layer is bypassed, the next control might succeed in protecting you from the attacker. Now an example of this might be to have multiple firewalls from multiple vendors. So that if one vulnerability gets exploited in one of the, uh, one of the vendor's products, then the other one might still keep the attacker at bay. And generally, the way you should think about defense in depth is to design your network, design your security solution, just like each security control can and will be compromised at some point. Then ask yourself, if this piece, if this security control gets compromised, what are we going to do? And another level of this defense in depth approach is strictly related to people. That is your personnel. Training sessions, awareness, even things like implementing multi-factor authentication in your entire company so that when people leave their passwords written on sticky notes or they just tell them to one another, they won't be able to compromise their accounts anymore because they do need two factors to authenticate every time they use the, their file server or their email or their VPNs. This is also where you should think about implementing separation of duties. This is a concept that refers to the fact that no single person, no single employee, not even the CEO, is going to have enough permissions to do whatever they want. So consider designing your critical business processes so that at least two people are involved in a decision. For example, one should be an initiator and one should be an approver or a reviewer so that no single person is going to have absolute power to do whatever they want. Because that single person, if they become compromised or if they become an insider threat, they're going to pose a real danger to your company. Also, be careful about third party consultants or even business partners. Most likely they will have some level of access within your network, within your company, and you should consider them as a potential threat. Don't give them more permissions that they need in order to just do their daily business. Mandatory vacations, and that's another concept that might sound funny, but it's actually critical to avoid fraud and misuse of resources. Mandatory vacations refer to the fact that from time to time, a specific person that does a specific type of job should be replaced, at least temporarily, like for two weeks or a month of mandatory vacation, just so that any attempts at compromising or of misuse of resources or fraud could be detected, just in case that person was involved in some illegal activity. And finally, don't forget about succession planning. It does sound cynical, but you have to plan for situations when key employees are lost forever, for any reason. What happens if one single admin, for example, had access everywhere, knew all the passwords, had all the certificates maybe in its, on its personal device, is unfortunately involved in a car accident. What do you do then? And try to train your HR department as well, because when they're posting job openings, they might be giving away a lot of information, sensitive information about what's in your network, your, the vendors, the devices, the technologies, the protocols that you're using. You don't want to make the job of the attackers any easier. Now, defense in depth can be applied to three different directions, so to say. And the first one is going to be the business processes in your company, which means basically how is the data flowing within your company? Which people are involved? How is that data handled? How it is stored? How it is transported? And so on. Now, continuously try to look for weaknesses in these processes. Look for any places where attackers might try to exploit a vulnerability. And don't forget to learn 
from the previous trends. Monitor how your processes are working over time and try to see if there's anything you can improve security wise so that you can aim for some sort of a continuous improvement process of your internal data flow in your company. Second one would be the technology part. And this is where you think about which specific pieces of software or hardware can be improved, replaced, upgraded, changed in some way to improve your security posture. Also remember the concept of security as a service where you actually outsource the security effort, not the security liability or responsibility, but the effort of analyzing, designing and making those changes in order to improve your security posture. Finally, when it comes to networking, very important to constantly review your network design. Everything starts from the way you design the network from the very first day. Think about network segmentation. Segment out as many parts of the networks as you can. So separate networks using VLANs, switches, layer two switches, layer three switches, using routers between different networks, access rules, firewall rules, dedicated firewall devices. Make sure you absolutely know and you are always in control as to how is the traffic flowing within your company. Also remember that this segmentation helps you out a lot when an incident happens. If an incident happens and a certain part of the network is affected, a well-designed and well-segmented network will help you isolate that affected part and keep the business running in the rest of the network. The best way to segment your network would be by using something called SDN, that's Software Defined Network, where everything that you design as a network segment or a firewall policy or even a firewall instance is designed in software, in code, and you can reconfigure it on the fly almost in instantaneously and even better, sometimes even automatically when an incident is discovered. And of course, all the segmentation has to be done after a careful decision about how you plan to use your network which traffic flows are required, which department needs to communicate with which department, which users need access to which devices. In extreme cases, you might even implement something called an air-gapped network. That is a network that is completely at a physical level disconnected from any other type of connection, local or remote, not to mention the internet, of course. As a type of security, that's usually a bit extreme because it's going to create a lot of administrative issues for you. You won't be able to administer that network from a remote location. You won't be able to update the software that's running in there so easily but it might be the only solution when you are running devices or software versions that have become obsolete, that cannot be updated anymore, and which present a real security risk if exposed to the outside world. But also, one last thing when it comes to segmentation, don't forget to keep it simple. Don't make it too complex so that you won't even understand how the traffic flows is supposed to look like. Don't make it so hard to understand that when somebody comes after you, they won't be able to understand what's the purpose of all those firewall policies and NAT policies and static routes that you might have in there. So don't let it get out of control. Don't make it too complex. Now, a configuration baseline is something that you should definitely always have in your network. And what a configuration baseline is, it's actually a definition of normal. What is normal to you, to yourself as an admin or to your network or to your company? However you are measuring yourself falls between some values, some thresholds that define what is normal. And the main idea is that you need to know how things in your network look like when everything is okay, when everything is running in order to be able to detect when something goes wrong. So a baseline is just a piece of information that says this is how your servers or your networking devices should look like. This is how their configurations should look like. Any new changes that you perform to your network, moves, adds, or changes should have the baseline attached. So for example, for a new server that you want to bring in or a new virtual machine that you want to create, this is how the process list should look like. This is how much network traffic is expected to be generated. Uh, these uh, spikes in CPU usage and network usage are normal every day after, let's say, 12 o'clock or something like that. Now, if you don't know any of this, if you don't have a baseline like this, then the job of finding anomalies and actually detecting attacks before they happen is a job that you will hate <laughs> because you won't be able to prove anything. You won't be able to compare anything to what is normal in order to determine that there's something off happening in there. And you don't have to overcomplicate this either. You can start very simple. A configuration baseline can be as simple as a list of IP addresses that you have in use in your network. 
maybe with the MAC addresses that are associated in order to detect rogue devices, devices that have no place being connected to your network. Uh, let's say a list of services that are expected to be running at any point in time on your workstations or on your servers. How much CPU or how much memory is usually consumed by your devices? What list of processes you expect? What applications are whitelisted on your workstations? So it doesn't have to be something very complicated, but a little information goes a long way. Now, of course, we cannot mention workstations without talking about system hardening as well. Now, system hardening is a very generic term. Basically, it means reducing as much as possible the attack surface of a device, which can be a workstation, a server, a router or a switch, anything that's physically connected to the network, and then implementing some measures to properly secure what's left running. So you minimize the attack surface, you're left with some desired <laughs> attack surface, right? You do need to have some services running in there, maybe to, to serve your customers or to serve your internal employees. And then you make sure that you secure those points of connection, secure what's left to be exposed to the network. Major vendors fortunately help you out a lot here because most of them will publish some well-defined hardening guides. For example, if you Google search for hardening Microsoft IIS, you're going to find a lot of suggestions for how you can harden not only IIS actually, but you can search for guides that help you uh, securely configure out of the box uh, Windows Server installations, depending on their versions, Microsoft SQL installations, Linux servers, any type of service that can be installed usually has, especially if it's a wide, widely used service, they're going to have a hardening guide attached to them which basically is going to list all the best practices from a security point of view that you can follow in order to have a as secure as possible out of the box installation. Also, you have to keep in mind that sometimes not all systems will be, well, let's say, patchable. You won't be able to patch everything. You won't be able to update everything. That might simply happen because the system or the version is just too old and it, it's not supported anymore by the vendor. Uh, it also might happen with custom software, which was developed in-house or by some other company and they haven't agreed to provide any further updates or the company just went out of business. It's also very difficult for embedded systems and IoT devices, especially because most of them don't even have administrative interfaces that allow you to overwrite the firmware or perform some software update. Some of them don't even allow you to do basic configuration tasks. When you're facing issues like these, well, unfortunately, the only solution is going to be something like installing some sort of a uh, compensating control or mitigating control, which in front of those vulnerable devices in order to restrict as much as possible the way they are exposed to the outside world. Now, just to briefly go over a couple of examples that you will find in many configuration hardening guides out there. So you're going to find things like deactivate non-critical components, like hardware components which are not being used, or services that are enabled by default, perhaps right after the operating system's installation. Any applications that might come by default with the software component or with the operating system, but you are not going to use. Uh, also, disable unused user accounts. Uh, user accounts that are not normally used can go unnoticed when somebody suddenly decides to use them because nobody's looking for any information about those user accounts. Of course, patch and update anything that you can, operating systems, firmware, applications, anything that can be updated. Most of the updates out there are going to be focused on security and less on features. For hosts and workstations, make sure you restrict access to peripheral devices like external storage devices, media devices, wireless connections like NFC or Bluetooth if they're not needed. Don't forget to configure user accounts with the least privilege principle in mind, right? Don't allow a user to perform more actions that are required for his or her job. Especially be careful about privileges that allow users to download and run or install additional software on their systems. Make sure you enforce access control lists on resources, like for file servers or databases, for example. Make sure nobody outside the assigned departments or the interested departments and as far as host protection goes, don't forget to install some host protection software suits like antivirus or host-based IPS solutions on your workstations. 
And as you can probably see or guess, <laughs> patching and updating is pretty much always going to be the number one solution for all remediations that need to be performed in your environment. And what's interesting to note, and to know actually, is that a lot of the exploits out there, a lot of the attacks that can be seen in the wild are taking advantage of vulnerabilities that already have a patch available, but they rely on the fact that the users or the admins are not so security concerned and they just ignore those patches and don't apply them in a timely manner. So don't fall victim to an attack that has already a solution just because you chose to ignore the solution. And in any type of company, patch management should be a dedicated process and should be integrated in your configuration management processes. Now, when your network kind of grows, you might want to think about including some uh, testing for newer patches because patches sometimes crash systems or add new bugs. So whenever you want to massively deploy a new update to your workstations or to your servers, make sure you have a testing environment where you test that patch first, see that it doesn't break anything else, and then decide whether you're going to apply it to the production network as well. And make sure you remember for the exam at least a couple of automated patching solutions. Things like Windows Update, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Another one being Windows Server Update Services. It's an automated patch installation method and also provides you with a local repository of patch information, especially for larger networks. In the Linux environment, remember APT, Aptitude Package Manager, and the YAM Package Managers. Uh, YAM stands for Yellow Dog Updater Modified. By the way, I don't think that's going to help you remember it, but you know, just for general knowledge. Nevertheless, whichever solution you choose to implement, make sure you have one, make sure you do have a patch management solution. So always ensure that your systems are up to date. Now there are dedicated solutions that monitor the state of your systems and warn you whenever there's a non-compliance detected or where, wherever there's a newer update available for some device in your network. Some dedicated solution like this, like the Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager or Endpoint Manager, are going to help you a lot and also going to help you build that initial inventory of assets that I've kept reminding you of. All right, so for the exam, make sure you understand the importance of a configuration baseline. Why is it important for our security posture? And why is it helping us detect anomalies before an attack actually happens? And also make sure you understand the importance of configuration hardening and just a couple of the steps or at least a couple of examples of what you would normally do in order to harden a new server, a new workstation or a new application that you bring into your network. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and see you on the next video.